I want to start off by giving you something of the idea of what was going on in the world at the time. There was a really, really strong movement toward pacifism. There was a belief that all wars could be avoided if you just simply refused to make them. Studies were done that indicated that it took two sides to make a war, and if one side refused to make it, the war would not occur. And men like Albert Einstein, who had achieved fame as a physicist, wrote a book entitled Why War, wrote another book about pacifism, and a lot of persons believed that this was a, did a lot to encourage men like Adolf Hitler and Mussolini to uh, make their moves. They believed that the other side would not go to war, and it looked like the other side wouldn't. This is not in the book, but there was, there was a pact made among the nations, the Kellogg Bryan Pact, that, where that the nations promised we will outlaw war and will not go to war anymore. Very, very bad. In addition, there was a man named Senator Nye who had conducted a report, and uh, this is in the book now. Senator Nye said in his report that munitions makers and bankers had done a lot to get the United States involved in the war, had done a lot really to finance World War I by financing both sides. These multi-billionaires would uh, give their money to both sides to get the war started because they felt like the war would greatly enrich them and empower themselves. And uh, again, this did a lot to turn people against war. And again, folk, I want to tell you something, what you already know, war is very, very terrible. And I can understand why people are against it. But one thing we learned from World War II is sometimes it only takes one side wanting a fight, and the other side has no choice but to go into it. Something Abraham Lincoln said, the war is forced upon us. All right, with that kind of a background, some of the details of what were happening. Um, the book starts off with a man who was involved in the, the dropping of the first atomic bomb, a man named Paul Tibbetts. At the age of 12, he got in an airplane. No, he was not the pilot, but he took an airplane flight, and he became fascinated with airplanes. Then when the war broke out, he joined the uh, Army as an airplane person. No, the, uh, there was no separate Air Force at that time, but the, our airplanes were part of the Army. He joined and eventually he was assigned to fight against the Japanese and he was involved in the dropping of the first atomic bomb. We'll talk in more detail about that later. Britain, France, and the United States, the three big powers at the time were determined that they were going to avoid war at all costs and folk, I really think this was the big mistake. We're not going to fight a war no matter what and if we refuse to fight it, it would be none. And a man named Gandhi in India taught the world the same thing, just simply refused to fight and, um, yes, refused to fight and the other side will pick you up and throw you alive into hot ovens. Mm -hmm. That sounds gross, but this is exactly what was to happen later. And uh, throughout the Jews, the Jewish rabbis, I mean, Albert Einstein himself was a Jew, but they were teaching pacifism. I've been told, and I went to a synagogue one time, but I've been told that today's rabbis do not teach pacifism anymore. You know that for a fact yourself, yeah. I mean, again, it took a bunch of them being thrown alive into hot ovens and starved to death, and no more pacifism. Again, um, all right. Germany, Italy, and Japan felt humiliated as a result of World War I, especially Germany. Now, keep in mind, some one of my students some years ago did a paper, the German people were told throughout the war we're winning. And it was true. No foreign army went into Germany itself during World War I, and it was true also that the Russians pulled out of the war in World War I. They were told that they were winning the night before that they went to the surrender. They went to bed being told they were winning, woke up the next morning and were told Germany has surrendered and our Kaiser has abdicated. And that was a shock, I mean, that to their, them that they never fully recovered from. Uh, again, their press was lying to them. And, um, We'll talk more about how the American press has sometimes been guilty of the same thing. But anyway, Germany felt utterly humiliated. Um, 
Japan withdrew from the League of Nations and they invaded Manchuria, which is part of China. And President Roosevelt did absolutely nothing about it. China protested to the League. The League sent a letter to Japan in protest and that was it. Same thing, Italy invaded Ethiopia. Now this may surprise, but Italy had invaded Ethiopia in the late 1890s and Great Britain had supplied Ethiopia with guns and Ethiopia whipped Italy, yes. Yes, it did. Ethiopia whipped Italy, and this was a really humil humiliation to Italy. But this time, Italy had tanks and planes that Ethiopia didn't have. So, uh, Italy being led by Mussolini. Mussolini, by the way, looked back to the Roman times. He had dreams of repeating the conquest. But I want to say this about Mussolini's conquest. His victory over Ethiopia was destined to be just about the only victory he was to win in World War II. After that, his army sort of suffered defeat after defeat. It was not the fault of the Italian soldier, it was the fault of their officers higher up, and not the fault of Mussolini himself. But anyway, uh, Mussolini uh, invaded Ethiopia. The League of Nations sent a letter of protest to Italy and did nothing more. Um, Meantime, the Soviet Union had not been recognized by the United States owing to the fact that we do not like their communism. But for President Franklin Roosevelt finally recognized the Soviet Union as the rightful government because by this time the American people wanted him to. This was in the 1930s and the Soviets, the communists had taken over in 1917 and a lot of people felt like it was time the United States resumed normal diplomatic relations with the Soviet Union. So Roosevelt recognized the Soviet Union as a legitimate country. During the prosperous times of the 20s, Adolf Hitler had lean times. But then when a depression came along in Germany, Adolf Hitler, uh, to him this was great. To make a long story short, through purely constitutional means, he took over Germany, and once he had taken over Germany, he got the German Congress to give him absolute total power, saying that this was needed because, uh, in order to fight the Depression and to restore Germany's dignity. He got the power he wanted, and in a short order, he ended Germany's Depression, as I've already mentioned. All right. Hitler started to rearm Germany, contrary to the Treaty of Versailles that had been signed in 1919. And the rest of the world did absolutely nothing. Look the other way. It's like the nations of the world would say to Hitler, listen, I'll go to war if you do that again. No, I, was, I promise I'll go to war next time. No, no, I, but I'll go to war. Well, I haven't gone to war, but I'll go to war next time. And they kept backing up and backing up and promising up. Well, finally, finally they did. But by that time, it was almost too late. But, um, now, in the meantime, Roosevelt pursued a good neighbor policy with our Latin American neighbors. Now, folk, I've talked about how that the first Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt, Taft, and Wilson, had uh, sent armies down into Latin America several times and gotten the Latin American people really angry at us. Particularly Woodrow Wilson tried to impose democracy on those Latin American countries and folk, your book will state what we would talk about when I was in high school. Those Latin American countries were not ready for democracy and would not be for a long time. But the United States insisted that they become democracies well, in the case of Roosevelt, the, I mean Franklin Roosevelt, he allowed the dictatorships. He saw that a dictatorship was more stable for Latin Americans than democracy. Now, this is not necessarily true in 2019, but in the 1930s, things were different. But he allowed the dictatorships. Now, again, to keep this in mind, because Stalin was to point out our hypocrisy later when Stalin was to take over Eastern Europe. Yes. So you said you said Hitler allowed the uh, dictatorship. Um, no, Roosevelt, Roosevelt, all right, Roosevelt. Uh, he was, 
He pursued a good neighbor policy with the Latin American countries. Now, folk, again, this was to be extremely important because when the war broke out, Latin America was not being able, was not used as a base of operations for the war against the United States like Germany had tried to do in World War I. So that meant that Latin, the Latin American countries stayed out of the war until late in the war. Now again, if you check the record, you'll find that almost all these Latin American countries eventually declared war against Germany. Yes, they did. When the war was over, practically over and Germany was almost thoroughly whipped, then you might say they all were guilty of piling on. But at, but at first, they at least stayed out of our hair. And um, again, um, Roosevelt allowed the dictatorships because he felt like they promoted stability and also we benefited greatly from trade with Latin America. In times of depression, it was felt like we had to do whatever was necessary, even if it went against our ideals. And again, depressions do that to a person. Uh, but now, in order to get his way, he used tariffs and uh, got these countries to trade in such a way that it favored the United States. In other words, one country was charged one tariff, another country was charged another tariff, all of it manipulating these countries through economic means to get them to trade our way uh, rather, than, um, you know, rather than have a uniform standard. Again, this tariff issue is still an issue which we're going to be talking about. The tariff has been an issue from George Washington State to till today. All right. Um, a lot of Americans wanted isolation, isolationist, that was the key, and especially since we did not want to get our young men involved in another world war. And when Britain and France, the United States would not act, Germany and Italy began a program of conquest. Now, now folk, I'm not going to ask much of this on the test, but uh, Hitler started off moving into the Rhineland. If you know about Europe's geography, the Rhine is one of the rivers in Europe, and uh, it was a very good region with a lot of minerals and a lot of stuff that Germany needed. So Hitler moved into the Rhineland and took it. Great Britain, France, United States did nothing. So he began, he began uh, to uh, proceed to um, move in and uh, take Austria. He annexed Austria. All right. In the case of Austria, there is a story about a family, a noble family, who escaped from Austria during the war, and the play was made about called The Sound of Music. The play is not altogether historically accurate, but what is true is that these Austrian noblemen and his family did escape from Austria during the war, and their descendants still live in Canada to this day. They escaped to Canada to escape having to serve in Hitler's army. But uh, he took Austria, because after all, Hitler had been born in Austria, and he said that Austria has a whole lot of oppressed Germans, so he said, I'm going to free up the oppressed fellow Germans in Austria, took it. So Austria is now on Hitler's side. Uh, then he went to the student land, I mean, taking these places one at a time. In the meantime, civil war had broken out in Spain. If Britain and France had come to the aid of the people for democracy, the war might have had a different outcome. Instead, Britain and France stayed in Britain and stayed in France. But in the meantime, Hitler and Mussolini both sent armies into Spain to fight for the dictator, Franco. Franco was to govern Spain until about 1977. But uh, Franco took over Spain. However, Franco did not help Hitler and Mussolini during the war. Franco said, our country is not able to fight. And wisely, he stayed out. Um, Hitler was upset, but he could not persuade Franco to move. But anyway, Franco, the dictator, took over Spain. Well, all right. Then Hitler, after he'd taken a student land, an event occurred. Your book does not emphasize, maybe as long as it should have, but the Prime Minister of Britain was Neville Chamberlain. Chamberlain now was a very intelligent man. And he did what you would expect an intelligent man to do at the time. He personally went to Hitler and had a talk with Hitler. Hitler and Mussolini met with the President of France 
and the Chamberlain himself, and they worked out a treaty, a treaty with Adolf Hitler. And Hitler promised in this treaty that he had gotten all the land he needed, he would never take any more land. And Neville Chamberlain is showing, is being shown in the movie, we still have the movie, getting off a plane, waving a piece of paper and saying, with this, folk, I guarantee peace in our time. He said, I spoke with Mr. Hitler this morning and I promise we are both committed to peace. All right, I'll put him pause. Who knows what happened? Yes. I think he said Hitler didn't. He, he, he went right against what he said, right? He went right against what he had. What else? So basically, the treaty was not worth the paper it was written on. Um, what can we say? And again, it goes down in history as being a prime example of what a nation should not do when dealing with a man of the caliber of Hitler. It's called appeasement. The treaty gave Hitler everything he wanted, and all that, basically Hitler could keep the student land, could keep the Rhine land, could keep Austria, could keep Czechoslovakia, all this territory taken, he'd get to keep. He promised he would never take any more land, and the war was, <coughs> the war was over. Yeah, sure it was. All the time Hitler was planning his invasion of Poland, within days, Hitler invaded Poland. If you know anything about the British government, they can replace the prime minister anytime they want to, and even right as I speak, the present prime minister is in deep trouble for some other reason. But anyway, leave that's jumping around. But anyway, the people of Great Britain replaced Chamberlain, who had done what he felt like he was supposed to do, done his best. Replaced Chamberlain with Churchill. Reason was Churchill had said all along, we can't make a treaty with Hitler and Fury on you, Mr. Churchill. No, I promise you, don't make a treaty with Hitler. Then when Hitler broke it, all of a sudden the people flocked to Churchill. And hey, you were right all along. Churchill became the prime minister, and Churchill was to be the prime minister during most of World War II. Now, folk, you might be thinking that the invasion of Pearl Harbor by the Japanese started World War II. Not quite. The invasion of Pearl Harbor got the United States involved in World War II. But World War II actually began in Europe with the invasion of Poland in 1939. Poland was invaded, contrary to Hitler's agreement. And Great Britain and France declared war on Poland. And World War II had begun. Well, for eight months, there was no significant fighting, and this was owing to the fact that Hitler had not expected war. So Hitler had to, I mean, Hitler spent a lot of his time thinking and planning, drawing up plans, and listening to the men around him. Um, they would plan together. So Hitler had to replan. So for eight months, there was no fighting significantly, and it was called the phony war. And then Hitler began his moves. His moves were, he conquered Denmark, Norway, the Netherlands, Belgium, and France. Yes, I said France. Now, France fell too easily. Um, none of these countries except for France were expected to be able to stand up to Hitler anyway. Norway was not ready to fight. Belgium and Netherlands were too small to stand up to Hitler. But here was the problem, a real problem for France. And folk, this is one of the times when democracy fails. France had a line called the Maginot Line between Germany and France. The Maginot Line ended at the Belgian border. It ended in Switzerland. Now, granted, Hitler would not invade Switzerland. I mean, if you know anything about Switzerland, every Man and woman in Switzerland is expected to join the army, even the lame and the blind. Only the extremely feeble are exempt. Everybody joins the army, and everybody is trained, and the training lasts 20 years. And if an army ever invades Switzerland, they can expect to be shot at from every house. Nobody has invaded Switzerland in almost more than 200 years. 
and the Swiss are known to be extremely fierce fighters, and also they know the Swiss are in the mountain. But now Belgium, something else, Belgium is a very flat, very, very flat country. It's one of those what they call low countries. Well, the Maginot Line should have gone all the way between Belgium and France. It didn't. The French were behind on depending on this line, and the Germans instead went through Belgium like they tried to do in World War I, and folk, the new king of Belgium, this, this king's father had fought the Germans for four years, but the new king fought the Germans for one hour and surrendered. And this made, that meant that Belgium was wide open for the Germans to march through and get to France. France was circumvented around. The French people were unprepared for this attack, and to this day, if you go to France, they all still blame each other. Who went wrong? I think I know what happened. Because of democracy, and this is what happened to them. Each side gives in a little bit and is compromised. I don't believe any dictator would have allowed something like that to go on. But, uh, so they wind up, well, we'll just build a line to the border. And after all, in World War, Belgium will hold them off for a while until we can... Well, the British were caught also. And here's where the war should have ended, folk. And here's where Hitler made more than one of his mistakes. The British were at Dunkirk. And they were trapped. And they were helpless. And Hitler decided, no, this is a trick. So he called all of his generals into a meeting at Berlin. Instead, if only, if only, he would have told his generals, hit him hard at Dunkirk and drive him into the sea. He called his generals and stopped them, and the British came to the aid at Dunkirk. And more than 300,000 British soldiers were rescued to fight again. Now, okay, Britain lost all his equipment. I mean, the, the British came in boats, even small boats, little John boats, big ships, uh, sailing vessels, fishing vessels, merchant vessels, anything. The British came across the channel, went to the troops at Dunkirk, rescued them all. They left behind their equipment, but then the equipment was old and obsolete anyway, and did not, they did not miss it. Besides that, the British were getting more equipment from the United States. How yes. Did, how did Cylinder, you said Cylinder 9, I'm trying to figure out, right in the early on board, you got Cylinder 9, is that yeah. NYE? That's Senator NYE, and bear with me a second, folks, something is going wrong here. 